You are listening to Gone But Never Forgotten. Our topics can include, but are not limited to, murder, sexual assault, graphic and gruesome details, and more. These topics are adult in nature and are not meant for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. If you have ever taken a deep look at a serial killer and their entire story before, you know that there are many things that people believe are parts of building a person who is capable of killing and becoming a serial killer. The more that you study the psychology and the childhoods of these killers, you really do start to see a lot of similarities across many of their stories. One of those similarities is the fact that many serial killers have some sort of childhood trauma within their lives. Studies have led scientists to believe that during the formative years, things like trauma can teach the brain to suppress empathy and cause problems with emotional impulses. Over the next few weeks, we are going to cover a serial killer who did have trauma in his past and the ability to fool everyone around him into believing that he was someone different than he truly was. The question, though, in this story is whether the trauma was indeed a pressure point or not for the murders that he committed. This week, we're going to cover the life of one of the worst serial killers of all time on our way through a series where we will talk about everything that is pertinent. Hello, my name is Lance, and welcome to episode 81 of Gone But Never Forgotten, The Life of John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy was born at Edgewater Hospital in Chicago, Illinois, on March 17th of 1942. He was born into a middle-class family to his father, John Stanley Gacy, and his mother, Marion Elaine Gacy. He was the middle child of the family and the only boy that the couple would have. John Sr. was an auto repair machinist and a veteran from World War I. Marion was a homemaker. John's parents named him after John Wayne, a Hollywood icon who starred in westerns and was a symbol of manhood in Hollywood and across the entire world. John Gacy's family was of Polish and Danish descent, and the family's background was Catholic. Growing up, John was close to his mother and his two sisters, but his relationship with his father was difficult and tumultuous. John Sr. was an alcoholic, and he was abusive to his family, both physically and verbally, a lot of the time. A lot of his vitriol was directed at John Jr. because he felt that his son was not living up to his namesake, nor was he living up to the standards that his father expected from a man. He would call John dumb and stupid very often, and he always compared John to his sisters, both of whom he told John were better than he was. John has said that one of his earliest memories was of his father beating him with a leather belt when he was only four years old. Marion would try to keep John away from his father, and she tried to shield him from the physical and verbal abuse. In retaliation to that, though, John was told by his father that he was a sissy and a mama's boy because he would allow his mom to fight his battles. His father also found out that at times John would wear his mom's underwear. 
John Sr. would also frequently tell John that he was not a man at all and that he would likely grow up to be gay. His father would also ridicule him for being overweight and unathletic. The worst part was that even though John was enduring a lot of stress and abuse at the hands of his father, he still loved him, and he still was always trying to make his father proud, which seemed impossible. He did feel that no matter what he did, he would always be seen as a failure in the eyes of his dad. Later in his life, John would say, quote, My dad was domineering. My dad drank a lot, and when he drank a lot, he was abusive to my mother and to me. But I never swung at my dad because I loved him for what he stood for. Unquote. John would categorically deny that he had ever suffered any sexual abuse at the hands of his father but he did claim that he was the victim of many different sexual assaults during his childhood and formative years. John would say that the first time that he was sexually abused was when he was only five years old. He had gone with his mom to a friend's house, and while there, his mom's friend's daughter, who was 15 years old, took him up to her room and began to fondle him. The two moms would come into the room and see what was going on, and John watched on as the girl's mother hit her in front of him. When John was eight years old, he said that he was again fondled and assaulted by a contractor that his dad had become friends with, who was in his mid-thirties. The contractor would tell John's parents that he was going to take him out for ice cream, and then the two would play around and he would show him some wrestling moves. During those times alone, Gacy would be molested frequently, and although he never told his father why, John said that he finally told his dad that he didn't want to be alone with the man ever again. John said that he never told his father because he feared that his dad would blame him for the abuse. In 1949, John Gacy would run afoul of his father and the law for the first time, only at the age of seven. John's father found out that John and another boy had been caught sexually fondling a young girl. As punishment, John Sr. would whip John with a razor strap. The relationship between John and his father would further deteriorate when John was diagnosed with a heart condition and told to avoid all sports at school. In fourth grade, John would start to experience blackouts, and he was hospitalized from time to time because of them. In 1957, at the age of 15, John was also hospitalized when he suffered a burst appendix. John's father, though, was relentless, and he accused and assumed that John was faking all of the ailments that he was suffering from in order to get more attention, both at home and at school. John, even though his grades didn't reflect it, was a very intelligent young man. He would later say that he believed that his grades had fallen because of the time that he spent in the hospital for the blackouts and other ailments. He said that he estimated between the ages of 14 and 18, he had spent about a year total in the hospital. That time away from school, he believed, was the reason that his grades were not great in school, and that would certainly make sense. At the age of 18, John would start to use those smarts. He became involved in politics when he started to work for the Democratic Party in the United States as an assistant precinct captain for a candidate that was working in his neighborhood. A precinct captain is responsible for voter registration, leading get-out-the-vote efforts, distributing literature, and promoting the party while listening to the people. John's father was still not impressed, though, and told his son that he was becoming a patsy. John said at this point in his life he knew that his father was never going to approve of him, so... He took this position so that he could feel the approval of others in place of that from his father. John would then bounce around the country a little bit. He tried moving to Las Vegas with a cousin who had left to get away from family. 
seeing a lot of that need in his own life, he went there with the hopes that he could live with that cousin. While there, John would find work within the ambulance service, and then he would be transferred to a position with the mortuary. As an attendant there, John would confess that he had climbed into a coffin with a deceased teenage male, and he had embraced the body. He had found that he was in shock a bit with himself, called his mother, and asked if he could move back home again. His mom and dad agreed to allow him to do so. From there, John enrolled at Northwestern Business College and graduated in 1963. He would then take a management trainee position with a company called the Nunn Bush Shoe Company. He would be eventually transferred in 1964 to Springfield, Illinois, where he would become a manager. He also got engaged in March of 1964 to Marlin Myers, a woman that he worked with at Nunn Bush. John would also join the JCs, which is a leadership training organization that taught business development, management skills, community service, and business connections. He was named a key man in April of 1964, and he also had what he considered his second homosexual experience at that time as well. John would say that a colleague with the JCs got him drunk and then told him that he could sleep on the couch. The colleague would then perform oral sex on John. After being engaged for six months, John Gacy and Marlon Myers would get married in September of 1964. Marlon's father had purchased three Kentucky Fried Chicken stores in Waterloo, Iowa, and the couple moved there so that John could manage the restaurants on his father-in-law's behalf. While managing the stores, John would often invite employees over to his basement, and he would let them drink. John mostly associated with the teenage males that were in his employ, and he would make advances at them while drinking. Marlin would give birth to their first child, a son, in February of 1966, and subsequently a daughter in March of 1967. John had everything that a man could want at that point. A job with lucrative pay, a family, and happiness. When John's parents came to Iowa to visit in 1966, John said that he felt that he had finally earned the respect of his father. His dad, on that trip, would tell John that he was sorry for all of the physical and emotional abuse that he had inflicted on him for his entire life to that point. He told John that he had been wrong about him all of that time. In August of 1967, though, John Gacy would really run afoul of the law when he sexually assaulted a 15-year-old boy named Donald Voorhees Jr. Donald's father was a local politician. John had lured Donald into his house, promising that he would show him pornography. John would get Donald drunk and get him to watch a pornographic film, and then he persuaded Donald to engage in mutual oral sex. In March of 1968, Donald told his father that John had assaulted him, and police were immediately called. John Gacy was arrested and charged with performing oral sodomy on Donald, and also attempted assault on another 16-year-old boy. John would deny that any of the charges were true, and even asked for a polygraph test to clear his name. The polygraph test, though, showed signs that John was being deceptive. On May 10th of 1968, John Gacy was indicted on the charge of sodomy. On August 30th of 1968, John would persuade one of his employees to beat up Donald so that Donald would not testify against him in court and the employee agreed to do so. In early September, he would lure Donald to an isolated park and would spray Donald in the eyes with mace and then attack him. Donald, though, would report the assault to police, and very quickly the trail led back to John, who was additionally charged with hiring someone to assault and intimidate a witness. 
On September 12th, John Gacy was ordered to take a psychological evaluation at the University of Iowa. Gacy was examined for over two weeks by two different doctors, and they concluded that he suffered from an antisocial personality disorder and said that his behavior pattern would likely ensure that his behaviors would continue if he was left in society. He was, however, deemed mentally fit for trial. So, on November 7th of 1968, John Gacy would plead guilty to one count of sodomy, but he would also plead not guilty to charges that were related to other youths. Gacy said that Donald had offered himself to him and that he had participated only out of curiosity. His stories and tales, though, were not believed in court, and he was convicted of sodomy on December 3rd and given a 10-year sentence to be served in the Anamosa State Penitentiary. On that same day, Marlin filed for divorce and requested that she be awarded the family home, the family property, and custody of their children, as well as alimony, should that day ever come. Courts ruled in Marlin's favor, and the divorce would be finalized on September 18th of 1969. John would never see Marlin or their children ever again. While he was in jail, as you can imagine, Gacy worked hard to be recognized as a model prisoner. He worked in the kitchen and oversaw improvements for the prisoners, including a raise in their pay and also the construction of recreation options for the prisoners, including a mini golf course. Gacy would apply for parole for the first time in June of 1969, only seven months after he was first imprisoned. That was denied. John would then work tirelessly towards parole, completing his high school degree between then and his next hearing. He received his diploma in November of 1969. Just a month later, on Christmas Day, John would receive word that his father had passed away from cirrhosis of the liver. Gacy's request for supervised leave to attend the funeral was also denied. On June 18th of 1970, Gacy was granted parole with 12 months of probation after serving essentially a year and a half of his 10-year sentence. One of the probation conditions that was levied against him was that John was to return to Chicago to live with his mom. Only eight months after he returned to Chicago, Gacy would again be charged with sexually assaulting a teenaged boy. The boy claimed that Gacy had lured him into his car by offering him a ride instead of waiting for the bus at the Greyhound Terminal. Instead of driving the boy home, though, he had driven the boy to his own house and tried to force him to have sex with him. This charge, however, was thrown out because the boy failed to appear. One year after his return to Chicago, on June 22nd of 1971, Gacy was again arrested and charged with aggravated sexual battery and reckless conduct. A boy said that Gacy had shown him a sheriff badge and lured him into his car and forced him to perform oral sex. These charges, too, would be dropped, though, when the young man attempted to blackmail Gacy. One would think that all of those transgressions and charges would have been breaches of Gacy's parole, but they did not hear in Iowa about any of those incidents, and his parole would come to an end on October 18th of 1971. All records of Gacy's criminal convictions in Iowa were then sealed and essentially erased, leaving anyone looking into him to see that John Gacy had never been convicted of any crimes. With his life now seemingly able to return to some semblance of normalcy, Gacy would buy a ranch-style home in Norwich, Illinois. The house was located at 8213 West Summerdale Avenue. At that time, Gacy was active in his community, and he was friendly and helpful in any way possible with his neighbors. He would give his time, his tools, and his advice to anyone that asked. 
He even plowed sidewalks in the area free of charge to make life easier for everyone. He would also become known for hosting massive summer parties that were themed and apparently a lot of fun. Up to 400 people would attend these parties, including business people, politicians, and anyone that was anyone in their community. In August of 1971, John Gacy would get engaged for the second time in his life, this time to a woman named Carol Hoff, who he had known since high school when the two had dated. The two would get married on July 1st of 1972. Living in the same home at this time were John Gacy, his mom, Carol, and Carol's two young daughters from a prior marriage. And there in 1971 is where we're going to leave the story of John Wayne Gacy for this week. As you can see from everything that is known about John's life, there doesn't seem to be similar elements that many serial killers have. Things like bedwetting, abusive animals, and other things appear to not have been a part of John's life. His story is certainly one that is baffling to those of us that like to try and pinpoint what makes a killer. John Wayne Gacy did have a rough childhood and relationship with his father. John Wayne Gacy certainly had homosexual interests and curiosities. However, those two things obviously do not make a killer. So what made John tick? And what caused the things that we will discuss in future episodes to take place? The reality is that we may truly never know. Chime in on social media with us and let us know what you think about John's life up to this point. As we've discussed in the past, when you look at a life story of a serial killer, you do often find yourself having some semblance of sympathy for them and their life. However, as we've seen every time that we profile a serial killer here on the show, that changes, and very quickly. I'll certainly stand up here and say that I think that being a parent is the hardest job that anyone can have. Every single thing that you say or do can have long-lasting impacts on the lives of the children that are in your care. If you're a parent, or want to be a parent, make sure that you are aware of all of those impacts. I will close out this episode by thanking you all for taking the time to listen to this podcast each and every single week. It's greatly appreciated. Please sign up over on Patreon, and let's continue the conversations there every week. You don't need to be a patron to be a part of the discussion, and I'm going to be sure to post thought-provoking questions about this case and others when they come up. Of course, please also support the show in any way that you can as well. Let's keep this thing growing. I'll be right back here next week with Part 2 on John Wayne Gacy, so make sure that you come back and join me. Until then, parent well, be well, and most of all, be better. <laughs>